light at all used fluid to serum total protein ratio of more than 0.5 as one criteria fluid lactate dehydrogenase value of more than 200 units per liter as another criteria or fluid to serum LDH ratio of more than 0.6 to diagnose exudates with remaining fluids being categorized as transudate. Hi, welcome to part 7 of paper discussion video series. Let's start with our first question in this video. The antigen present in ABO blood group or the antigen which is most common in all the blood groups? So I have this confusion like what exactly the question is so you know much better. Anyways, we'll discuss both. Okay, so we even have ABO blood group which has four antigens. A, B, AB and A1. So four antigens present in a blood group called ABO. And then, as you know, we have ABO blood group in, so based on which we have blood group A, blood group B, AB and O. So we can, we can find out corresponding antigens, antibodies and genotypes. And along with this, I found another keyword that is antigen H. So this is something which is present in all the blood groups because this antigen H is considered as a precursor for formation of various other blood group antigens. Let me review some information. So H antigen, which is found on virtually all RBCs, is considered as a building block for production of antigens within ABO blood type. And HH blood group, we have a blood group called HH, as you know, Bombay blood group, isn't it? So because H antigen is a precursor of ABO blood group antigens, if it is not produced, the ABO blood group antigens are also not produced. I'm telling you this statement to give you the importance of this H antigen. So H antigen is virtually found on all erythrocytes as it is a building block or precursor for formation of various other antigens in ABO blood grouping system, right? I hope it's clear and I hope this information is helpful. Now let's move on to the next topic, cellulose, submandibular gland, these are the keywords which we received. So based on this, let's review some information. So as you can see, a radiographic appearance of cellulose, submandibular gland cellulose. So dumbbell shaped cellulose on mandibular occlusal view. So arrows representing two lobes architecture in this particular illustration. So cellulose are stones found within the depths of salivary glands. And their submandibular glands are most commonly involved, most often around 83 to 94 percent of cases as given in white and farrow, followed by parotid gland 4 to 10 percent, followed by sublingual gland. This is attributed because submandibular gland has long and tortuous duct and an uphill flow in proximal portion and viscous saliva comparatively with high mineral content. I hope this information is helpful. Now let's move on to the next topic. There seems to be an image-based question on occlusal convergence, retention form, proximal box. These are the keywords which I received. So as you can see in this particular illustration, so occlusal convergence obviously indicates a retention feature, isn't it? So I hope uh, this information is suffice. So we can see diagrams of class two amalgam group preparations illustrating uniform pulpal and axial wall decks. And on top illustration, you can see 90 degree KO surface margin and below you can see occlusal convergence of walls. Now let's move on to the next topic, myositis ossificans. So those are the keywords I received. So myositis ossificans is, as the name itself indicates, ossification of muscle uh, structure because of trauma. Let's review some information. Myositis ossificans is a heterotropic bone formation within a muscle. The incidence in head and neck is rare, found mainly almost 80% of the cases in extremities. Concerning the head and neck, involvement of temporal muscle, masseter muscle, buccinator muscle, platysma muscle, and stenocleidomastoid muscle have been described in various case studies. Myositis ossificans can be divided into following subtypes. As you can see, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressivo, traumatic myositis ossificans, and neurogenic myositis ossificans. The fibrodysplasia ossificans progressive is a rare autosomal dominant disorder, has a prevalence of 1 in 2 million people and an onset in early childhood. Traumatic myositis ossificans, also called as myositis ossificans circumscriptor, is the most common form resulting in ossification of muscle after trauma 
or inflammation. And below you can see uh, two uh, red graphs, panoramic on left and uh, CT on right, where you can see the ossification of the masseter muscle in this particular case, right? Now let's move on to the next topic, appendicectomy, nerve injury. So those are the keywords that I said. Let me know if you need any further clarification apart from that being discussed here. So increased risk to ileoinguinal nerve injury is well recognized in various surgeries, including open appendicectomy, right? So it, as I said, let me know. We'll update relevant information or additional information or clarification description part of this video. Now let's move on to the next topic, Milwaukee braces. In fact, we discussed the same in one of the discussions previously, including their adverse effects, if you remember. So Milwaukee braces, so these braces were developed by Dr. Walter Blount of Milwaukee way back in 1940s as a removal post-operative immobilization device for treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis patient. As you can see in this illustration, patient with paralytic scoliosis wearing Milwaukee braces. So various undesirable effects associated with long-term uses or uses of Milwaukee braces include especially the intraoral complications, protrusion of anterior teeth, especially in maxillary arch, intrusion of posterior teeth, loss of facial height associated with inhibition of maxillary and mandibular growth. I hope this information is helpful in answering your question. Now let's move on to the next topic. Plural fluid lights criteria, this is some relevant information. So it's clinically important to classify plural in the static fluids into exudates and translates because this is indicative of underlying pathophysiological process involved and based on which treatment follows. Such a distinction allows appropriate investigations to be instigated, enabling better patient management. Light at all used fluid to serum total protein ratio of more than 0.5 as one criteria. Fluid lactate dehydrogenase value of more than 200 units per liter as another criteria. Or fluid to serum LDH ratio of more than 0.6 to diagnose exudates with remaining fluids being categorized as transudates. Right. So this is some information regarding light's criteria. Let me know if you need any further information or clarification. Now, let's move on to the next topic, thyroglossal duct cyst. Again, there seems to be an image-based question regarding this. So, thyroglossal duct cyst is a rare but occasional cause of benign midline neck pains. Thyroglossal duct cyst results from dilatation of remnants at a site where primitive thyroid descended from its origin at the base of the tongue, foramen cecum, if you remember, to its permanent location low in the neck. Failure of subsequent closure and obliteration of this tract predisposes to thyroglossal cyst formation. It most often occurs before age 20 but may be found in older population as well. We have discussed this previously as well if you remember. And also you can find clinical features of thyroglossal duct cyst presenting as a palpable asymptomatic midline neck mass at or below the level of higher bone as you can see in the illustration. The neck mass moves with a swallowing. Some patients will have neck or throat pain or dysphagia and the spectrum of clinical symptoms may be varied as given in Schaeffer's. Now, let's move to the next topic, needle prick injury. As far as I remember, the same was asked in one of the previous entrances as well, last year's entrance. We discussed the same in paper discussion videos, if you remember. So needle prick injury, the trauma site is washed immediately with soap and running water or mild disinfectant solution such as chlorhexidine gluconate that would not irritate the skin and then post-exposure prophylaxis is started ideally within two hours and not later than 72 hours after exposure, right? So this is the sequence. I hope this answers your query. Now, uh, before we proceed, consider this topic very, very important. Moving on to the final topic of this video, experimental phases, uh, phases, phase one, two, three, and four, uh, the amount of population or the amount of individuals that are tested. So those are the keywords which I received. So let's review some information. First of all, a clinical trial is only done when there is good reason to believe that a new test or a new drug would help people. So first we go with preclinical or lab tests and then we move on to clinical tests uh, with the hope that it would provide some benefit for treating any underlying uh, condition or uh, any pathology for that matter. Phase zero trials are the first clinical trials done among people. In these trials, a very small dose of a drug, for example, if you're testing a drug, we test it among uh, 10 to 15 people. Phase one, 15 to 30 patients. So uh, phase one aims uh, to find the best dose of a new drug with fewest side effects. So as I said, 15 to 30. Phase two trial further assesses safety as well as if a drug actually works. The drug is often tested among patients with specific type of cancers and 
phase two trials have done in larger groups of patients compared to phase one. Whereas phase three, 100 patients or more, the phase three trials compare a new drug to that of a standard of care drug. These trials assess the side effects of each drug and which drug works better, 100 patients or more. And phase four, as you can see, tests new drugs or experiments approved by FDA. The drug is tested in several hundred or thousands of patients. I think this answers it very Fine. So these are some of the topics I wanted to highlight in this specific video. And please do provide us with more keywords so that we can come up with subsequent paper discussion videos accordingly. Right? So enjoy your day. Wish you all the best. Love you all. Keep smiling.